What I would like to do this morning is I would like to pick up on our uh, theme, our preaching theme, which is discipleship, as you know. And um, if you recall, uh, I, st- I started speaking on the March the 18th on a particular uh, aspect of uh, discipleship, and it was this. There we are. Disciples think. Eh? No, no, you can do it. It's all right. Disciples think, yeah, and what we looked at, well, we were looking at the fact that, actually, if we're going to be disciples that follow Jesus, if we're going to be the authentic thing, then actually what goes on in our minds is really important. What you actually believe and what you are actually chewing on in that mind, you know, when when you're, you know, having a cup of tea somewhere and you sit down and your, your mind just goes, what are the thoughts that are beginning to roll around your head there? They are really important because they're informing you aren't they? They're absolutely informing you. And uh, so I was just thinking about this, thinking, actually, what I'd like to do is uh, I would like to look at um, the whole subject of the three A's of adoption, if you recall. And because when you become a Christian, what happens to you? You become a child of God. You are adopted into the family of God. And that happens instantaneously. The very moment that you say, Jesus, I believe, please forgive me. Wham! At that moment, your status changes from someone who is not a child of God to someone who is. Wonderful, wonderful. And um, so I think it's really important that we understand and actually start to believe that. And I'm looking at these three words as a kind of way of helping us to to get our thinking uh, right, if possible. And if you recall, last time I spoke about affirmation. Who was here for that one? Yeah, good, a few of you. Okay, well, just just to quickly to remind you then, we spoke about uh, how God wants to affirm you, that God loves you. But he also wants to affirm you. And we looked at the, the baptism of Jesus. Do you remember that? Yeah, good. Can, can I have a yes? Yes. yes? yes, good, you see. I'm learning. Um, <clears throat> uh, and we looked at the baptism of Jesus. And we saw that when Jesus was baptized, we saw when he looks up, he sees the heavens, it says, being torn open by this father who is desperate to get a message to his son. Here is the father tearing the heavens. I don't know how he does that. I imagine strips of something being torn. He's like, so get this out of the way. I've got a message for my son. I'm so urgently wanting to communicate something to him. And we see him ripping open the heaven. And then at the baptism, we see him shouting out loud. Shouts out. This is my beloved son who, who I am, with whom I am well pleased. The father affirms his son does it publicly. Parents, that would be really embarrassing if you do that to your children publicly like that. Um, so be careful with that one. But, but the father does it. The father does it. And uh, it's just wonderful to see how actually the father affirms you. And we saw that we needed to learn to live from affirmation and not for affirmation. And how many of us got affirmation from other sources you know, we get it from the well done of, oh, I've done this. Oh, are you going to tell me well done? Oh, that's very affirming for me. No, no, it can be toxic when you get it from the wrong place. We have a heavenly father who freely gives you his affirmation and his love. We've got to know that. We've got to know that and believe that. It's got to be in our head. So that's the first one we looked at. This week, I would like to look at this word, acceptance. Acceptance. Let's read two scriptures together. First one is this, Romans 15, verse 7. Accept one another then, just as Christ accepted you in order to bring praise to God. Accept one another then, just as Christ accepted you in order to bring praise to God. Second one is 1 Peter 2. You also, like living stones, are being built into a spiritual house to be a a holy priesthood, offering spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God. Through Jesus Christ. I didn't uh, add in Romans 5 here. Romans 5 says this when you become a Christian, you are made righteous. That means you are acceptable in his sight. You become fully acceptable to God. So I guess there are two questions really that come out of particularly uh, this scripture. Can you go on the next slide, please? 
That would be nice. I'd okay. It's the first scripture, accept one another then just as Christ accepted you. Two questions really that come out of this scripture. What does it mean to be accepted by Christ? What does that mean? And why is that important even? Why is that important? And uh, if we have time today, we'll look at what does it mean to accept one another. So acceptance. Why is that important? Well, let me, let me ask you some questions. Who remembers the first time you went round to visit your prospective parents-in-law? <laughs> oh, yes, it's still burnt on your brain, obviously. Yes, I can see that. Yeah, how are you feeling? Tad nervous? No? No, I don't believe you. <clears throat> most people, most people, I suspect, would be a tad nervous. How did you feel the last job interview you went for? You haven't been for years, okay, but fair enough. Bit nervous. What about a new church you joined? How did you feel about that? Ooh, a bit nervous. Why are you nervous? You're wondering, are they going to accept me or not? Are they going to like me? Am I going to fit in? Am I going to be accepted or am I going to be rejected? I've been reading a, a little bit of uh, stuff about, from psychologists at the moment uh, uh, just to, to find out what their view is on uh, acceptance. And uh, as you would expect, they all come out saying, we really need, it is a basic human need to behave you two. Right? I'll have to split you up. All right? <laughs> we have a basic human need to be accepted. We really have a it's a very strong need. In fact, this guy was doing some research from the University of Kentucky, and he was saying, when you ever switch on a, um, a virtual reality, not virtual reality, a, uh, a program like Big Brother, well, there's a name for that, I can't think what it is, the reason those are interesting is because it's the whole story is about, is this person going to be accepted or rejected? Oh, the new person's come. Are they going to be accepted by the group then? Oh, no, they're not. Oh, that's... Some people find that fast. I personally find it as boring as anything. But some people, it clearly makes good TV uh, for some people. But that's the theme. And the reason it's a theme is because it's a deep need we all have. We need to be accepted. And, uh, you know, you could even argue the rise of gang culture at the moment. Why are gangs rising? Well, uh, kids are not knowing that acceptance from their parents. So they're going somewhere where they will get accepted. Once you're in the gang, you're, oh, we'll fight for you. You're accepted. This need for acceptance is strong. And, you know, if we don't get acceptance, we will go somewhere to get it. We'll be drawn inevitably, inevitably somewhere where, to someone who is offering it to us. So I'd like to have a quick look at a couple of lists. There we are. So some of these are just uh, common sense. Some of them are, are picked up from what the psychologists have said and actually... A good chunk of them are just straight from Romans 5. So rejection. How do you feel when you are rejected or maybe consistently rejected? Well, you're going to feel worthless, small, timid. They don't want me is what's going to be going on in your heart. I'm unwanted. I'm undervalued. I have nothing to contribute here is what you'll be feeling. Some are even get to the point where they're depressed. You can be sad and lonely. Rejection means isolation in many cases. You're certainly going to feel distant from the person who's rejecting you, aren't you? That's often the pain in, when you have a relationship with someone and some rejection goes on. Suddenly it's the pain. I'm not close to you anymore. I feel rejected by you. It hurts, doesn't it, when you love somebody and that happens. It can make people angry and fearful. People can be very frightened of rejection. It can be a perpetual recurring fear. Will I be rejected? It's a big deal for some people. It can make you despise yourself. You can begin to say, well, I am clearly useless. I just don't achieve anything. I'm no good. And I, you know, it's they're right and I'm wrong. That's the kind of general feel. Uh, it's well known that uh, people who feel rejected can quickly start to reject others. Because the deal is, you don't want to be rejected by them, so you get in first to reject them so that you protect yourself. That's what the, the kind of mechanism that apparently goes on. And you can be defensive and sensitive. Ooh, 
Or you, and then you can perceive things that have been said that are not rejection as rejection. Ooh, what's that? That's not a good column, is it? That's really not a good column. Yet look at the opposite column. Look at acceptance. How do you feel? And this is often how you feel. How do you feel? Well, you're going to f- more likely to feel wanted, liked, valued. You're more likely to feel secure and relaxed. Well, I don't have to earn my acceptance here. I know I'm accepted, so that's great. I can relax. Well, hey, I kick my shoes off. Lovely, thank you. You can have a sense of belonging. I'm wanted here. I'm accepted here. This is my home. Yeah, I know. We, we have our moments, but this is my home. You're going to be more peaceful, more positive. You're going to be able to be more open and honest, aren't you? If you know you're accepted, you can say, well, it's okay for me to tell you what's really going on because I know you're not going to reject me. But if you fear rejection, openness is a potentially very expensive thing, isn't it? You're more likely to be more productive because your mind can, can not be constantly thinking about how do I be accepted? How do I be accepted? How do, no, your mind can do something else. Like, how do I see lost people saved? And also you have access. You have access to people in a way that when you're rejected, you don't. Can you see why it's really important that as Christians, we truly, deeply grasp that Jesus, that the Father, accepts you. Because if you believe that you are rejected, you will live in that column. That's the constant direction of travel you will be getting. And of course, it's a tragedy for us because Jesus has accepted you. Your legal status is that column, yet we experience this column. What is that about? Talk about having, having the good stuff and then having it taken away from you. No, we don't want that, do we? We want the fullness of our adoption. To be sons and daughters. That know, when I come to Father, he fully accepts me. He fully accepts me. It makes a huge difference. And I suggest it will make a huge difference to the reality of your Christian life. It's something that's worth fighting for, church. It's worth getting yourself before God to say, can you show me, do I feel accepted or rejected? How do I do on this one? It's a good one to go for. You know, um, I was thinking, I was thinking about the story of the prodigal son. I love that story. It's great, isn't it? And uh, I think think that the first century Jewish audience that Jesus told that story to would have been utterly shocked by that story. They just would have had their mouths hanging open. And they would have been shocked, not because of what the son does. They probably would have said, well, the boy's behaved appallingly. Look how badly he's treated the father. He should push off. He shouldn't be a son. And that's, they would say, that's right. And he's, when they heard that he was ended up feeding the pigs, they probably said, well, there you go. He's got his comeuppance. Jolly well, what he deserves. What would have shocked them is the reaction of the father. Now, it makes me weep, this story. The father's amazing acceptance. So this son, who has treated him so appallingly, comes back in rags, smelling of pigs. And he comes back to the father. He's been rehearsing his story, hasn't he? He's been saying, oh, I'm not worthy to be your son anymore. I, I've lost that right. Can, can, is it possible? Could you just get me in as a kind of servant somewhere? Yet the father runs. And we've, we've looked at this before, haven't we? Jewish men at this time did not run. It was not a dignified activity. It, that was something that children did and servants did. They did the running about. Yet fathers did not. They walked. Yet this father runs. He picks up his robes and he runs to the son. And he falls on him, doesn't he? And he kisses him. And he showers him with good things. With the robe and the feet and the, the feet, no, the uh, shoes, <laughs> and the ring. And then he has this feast for him. And he's doing a dance, really, isn't he, the father? Just his heart is full. Now, that's shocking. Yeah. That's shocking. But it describes what our father is like and how he accepts you. 
Because the truth is, we were that son. You and I were that kid. We treated him like that. It's difficult sometimes to grasp, but you know what? You were really sinful at one point in your life. No, I think you find out I was quite good, actually. No, no. Even the goodest among us were sinful. We still rejected the father. We still treated him like that. The father still says, come. I accept you. You're my son. You're my daughter. Come in. Let me bless you. Now, uh, I think the reality is we're also shocked by that story. Because most of us believe that acceptance is conditional. We don't believe in this sort of open-handed acceptance generally. Because our life has taught us that we get stuff because we behave well. We're accepted in our work because I work hard. But if I went into my work and I slobbed around, I don't mean so much now, obviously, but I mean more in publishing. If I'd gone in and I'd slobbed around and I was a, you know, a difficult character, and I'd, you know, eventually I'd be warned and then I'd be sacked. I would be rejected. So most of us know the way to be accepted is you work hard, you, you, you put in overtime, you behave well. Oh, I've earned it. We do that. It's true with family, where you were probably raised in your family. More than likely, when you behaved well, what did mum and dad do? They rewarded you, didn't they? And that's right. I'm not saying any of that is wrong. That's the way it works on the earth. So it's weird when God comes along and says, I've got a totally different way of doing things to the what, to stuff that you're used to. You are accepted irrespective of your behavior. That is hard for us to get our heads around. That is hard. It is. I, what I mean is our hearts. You see, because sometimes on a good day, I can be in this acceptance column and I can say, yeah, God, so let's I've just pray for someone that's been healed. I can say, God, you love me. I'm accepted. This is great. All these positive things. Fantastic. And then I might go and do something wrong. I might be rude to someone or I might sin. And then suddenly I think, well, maybe this column is a bit more appropriate for me after all. And I, and I sort of begin to drag myself a little bit here. And then God has to speak to me and pull me back again. Is it just me that does this? I feel accepted. And then I think, oh, but, but, you know, because I can't work out how can you accept me when I've, you know, eaten too much or when I've done something daft. How can you do? I don't understand how you do that. But of course, that is the mystery of the gospel. You get what you do not deserve, the grace of God. We come into the fullness of Christ, not because you've done a bean towards it, but because he has. And we come in. Just got to remember, I think. Just got to remember. Once upon a time, you were not acceptable to God. That's the truth. Before you became a Christian, before you said, Jesus, please forgive me for my sin. I'm a sinner. Please forgive me. I'm going to follow you as God for the rest of my life. Before you had that moment when he became real to you, you need to know something. You are utterly unacceptable to God. And he completely, there was a rejection that had gone on. Utterly. See, we're born in a fallen state. We sin instinctively. As soon as sin happens, uh, it, it puts gap between us and God. But the day came when the father said, I don't want this to remain. I'm going to send my son, Jesus. And we know Jesus lives this perfect life. He's the only man, actually, who was fully acceptable. And he lives this perfect life. And then he goes to the cross and he dies this incredible death. And then somehow, when I uh, receive him, all that he has accomplished is then attributed to me. That's not fair, is it? But I'm so glad it's there. I'm so glad it's there. See, Jesus, when he went to the cross, was utterly rejected. This man who was fully acceptable, the Bible says he was utterly rejected. The scorn and the shame of the cross was enormous. 
They even crucified him outside the city walls on a place called Golgotha, the rubbish dump. The message was very clear. You are rubbish. We utterly reject you, Jesus. Jesus endures this immense rejection so that you and I could be accepted. Accepted, fully accepted. Fully righteous in his sight. Fully allowed in. Fully sons and daughters. And we don't have to ping from one column to another. Today I'm accepted, tomorrow I'm not. No, no, no. Your status is accepted one. Because you are righteous in his sight. This is quite good, by the way. If you are. <laughs> so that day when you accepted him, your status changed. Radically, eternally, totally, irreversibly, your status changed from rejected one to accepted one. And that is where you will stay for eternity. There is no going back to your status of being rejected. So let's stop living like we're rejected. Because we're not. We're fully accepted. We're loved. Now you are his child. You are loved, held, wanted. You are precious in his sight. To be honest, any other rejection or acceptance does not matter. This is the one that counts. What has God said over your life? Have you given your life to him? Because it all changes at that point. Christians, let's get this deep in our heart, shall we? Let's work at getting this deep into our heart. Let's pray together. So Jesus, we uh, just want to say thank you again. Thank you for the enormity of the cross. Thank you we've been singing about it again today. Thank you we were singing about your return and how we'll be with you forever. Thank you, Lord Jesus, that our status now is it could not be stronger. It could not be better. It could not be more secure. Jesus, I want to pray, Father, for us that we would grasp somehow in our heart. This information would just go into our hearts that we are accepted by you. Why don't you just put your hands out? Holy Spirit, I am unable to do this, but I'm asking you to come and do it now. By revelation, Holy Spirit, will you reveal to your people that not only are they affirmed by you, but they are fully accepted. I pray that all fears, I pray for those who struggle with a sense of rejection because of what's happened in their lives. I ask you to replace that with a sense of acceptance. I ask that even today there will be a shift in people's lives and then in their experience. So Holy Spirit, come right now. God, you are the God that made us. You made us, you fashioned us and formed us. And I'm asking that change would occur now, Lord, that we would live for you and we'd live in the fullness of what it means to be a son or a daughter of Jesus. In your mighty name, amen. Amen.